have to drive that out of the United States. We no longer can have falsehoods, fear, and prejudice drive our political atmosphere. So you might wonder, why should I be here? Why is Beto different from the other candidates that are running? And the first thing is that Beto is charismatic. He has a defining quality. He can demand a crowd. The second thing is he came close to unseating Ted Cruz, one of the best political foils a liberal could hope for. And the last thing is that Beto is here because he wants to hear what rural Iowa and rural America is standing for. He is going from city to city. He wants to hear what we want. He's a blank slate that is waiting to be filled by our hopes and dreams for the United States. So now, I want to introduce Beto O'Rourke. Knoxville, how are you doing? Good to be with you. Thanks for having us out. And at a brewing company, no less. Uh, Peace Tree, thank you for hosting us today and providing the beverages for everyone. And to everyone who's enjoying a beverage right now, nothing wrong with doing that on a work day. Um, do it responsibly, uh, tip generously, um, have a good time. I'm really looking forward to having a chance to meet you and to be able to answer your questions and to hear what's on your mind and to briefly introduce myself. But I thought the best way possible to begin that introduction is to present my wife. This is the first time that she's joined me on the campaign trail in Iowa. Though This is our fifth trip as a campaign. This is her first, and I wanted her to, to come up and, and say a few words and maybe uh, share with you a little bit about what her first day in Iowa has been like. So ladies and gentlemen, Amy O'Rourke. statue to the men from this community who served in the Civil War for the Union, which is an important distinction because almost every courthouse that I visited in the 254 counties of Texas, there was a monument to those who served in the Civil War from the Confederacy. There's also uh, 
a memorial to those who served in World War II, in Korea, and in Vietnam. And I think this weekend, today, it's a really important time to take stock of how we got to this place. Those who put their lives on the line, those who are willing to sacrifice their lives for this country, for our freedoms, and for our democracy. We are at 75 years plus one day from the moment that Americans from this community and mine boarded transports, crossed the English Channel, and landed in Normandy. Many of them paying the ultimate price and sacrifice for this country, facing the greatest existential threat we had known until that point to all the Western democracies. And those young men who gave their lives, gave them not just for their communities, not just for their families, not just people who look like them, and not even just for this country. They literally, through their sacrifice, made this world safe for democracy. So I think about those who fought for the democracy that we have now abroad. I think about those who fought within this country to make sure that we secured voting rights for every single American, regardless of their race or their ethnicity, who marched in the Deep South, who integrated the all-white Democratic Party primary that existed for 20 years in my home state in Texas, which meant from 1924 to 1944, not a single African-American citizen in the state of Texas could choose their county commissioner, their member of Congress, their US senator, or vote in the Democratic primary for presidency. Those who are willing to engage in that struggle and in that fight have left us an inheritance that we can either build upon or we can squander because we face our own existential threats at this moment. Perhaps the greatest in all of human history, a changing climate warmed not by God nor by Mother Nature, but by you and by me, our emissions, our excesses, this country's inaction in the face of the facts and the science and the truth, the flooding that we've seen from the Missouri River, and more recently, the Mississippi, the fires that we've seen in California, the 58 inches of rain that fell from the sky in a single storm in Houston, Texas, the landfall record for as long as we've been keeping them in North America, these disasters and the toll that they take on communities, on property, on human life, will pale in comparison to what we will see going forward unless we confront this challenge, this existential threat, with everything that we have from every single one of us right now. We need to use the next 10 years to make sure that all of us are doing everything we can to free ourselves from a dependence on fossil fuels, to fully embrace renewable energy technologies, and as some in this room have taught me, to put farmers in the seat, the driver's seat, to make sure that we pay them for the environmental services that they want to provide, planting cover crops to capture more carbon out of the air, using precision and no-till farming to disturb less of the carbon that is in the soil, sustainable ranching to make sure that we renew the soil, the water, and the air that we all depend on, making sure that everyone in this country is doing their part and we don't meet this challenge by half steps or half measures or by only half the country. It is the only way for this country to be the indispensable country and set the standard for the rest of the world so that we, through our own moral authority, can convene the other powers of the planet and keep us from warming another two degrees Celsius. After which, those kids that Amy just talked about, Ulysses, Molly, and Henry, your kids and your grandkids, if we're unable to meet this challenge or this threat, will inherit something that is almost unimaginable for us right now. So these 10 years will require everything from every single one of us and the single greatest mechanism to make that possible is our democracy. And it has never been more badly damaged than it is at this moment. Our institutions, captured and corrupted by the highest bidder. Those political action committees and corporations and special interests who pay not just for influence and for access, but for outcomes that otherwise could not be explained. Why are we paying more? for prescription drug prices in this country than any other people on the face of the planet. 
Though we, the taxpayers of the United States, paid for the research and innovation and development that produced the cures and medications that are sold back to us at unaffordable rates, why do we allow some to profit on public investment at the expense of the very public who made that investment in the first place? If we are going to unleash this democracy and the genius and the potential of the American people, it has to work and represent every single one of us. And that is why this week we have announced a bold set of reforms to repair this democracy. First, make sure that everyone is participating. We aim to enroll more than 50 million additional Americans into our democracy by making sure they are registered through automatic and same-day voter registration. For the very youngest in this room, that means that 16 and 17-year-olds, while they're still in high school, are pre-registered so that when they turn 18 years old, they are ready to go and participate in that next election. We're gonna make sure that we also remove barriers to access to the ballot box. My home state of Texas was 50th before 2018 in voter turnout, not because we like our democracy any less than you do here in Iowa, but we were literally drawn that way by a state legislature that drew people out of a congressional district solely based on the color of their skin, their ethnicity, or their country of national origin. Voter ID laws, that allow you to use your license to carry a firearm to prove who you are at the ballot box, but will not allow you to use your student ID at the University of Texas at El Paso to prove who you are at the ballot box. With a new Voting Rights Act vigorously enforced, making sure that we don't have purges of our voter rolls, we don't keep people out based on the differences between us, but invite everyone into our democracy, and then restore faith in the elections themselves by investing in voter and election security, ensuring that there is a paper receipt for every ballot cast, and that we fully audit the elections that we hold in this country, and end the process of gerrymandering, which by members of Congress are choosing their own voters instead of the other way around, and then get rid of this process whereby we auction public service to the highest bidder, and outlaw political action committee contributions to federal races and elections, the INS, in addition, let's do this. There's, no, there's, there's nothing so magical about any single one of us that we should be able to stay in elected office for life. We should have term limits for those who serve in federal offices to make sure that they deliver their best and highest public service to this community and to this country and then get out of the way so that someone else can succeed them and do just as good, maybe more likely a better job, and bring their unique perspective and life experience and skills and expertise to bear on the challenges and opportunities of this country. When I served three terms in the US House of Representatives, and then I got out of the way in my community, we elected the first woman to ever serve the 16th Congressional District in El Paso, the first Latina to ever be elected to a congressional office in the state of Texas, which is 40% Hispanic. When we bring more people into our democracy, it functions at a far higher level, and it is then able to meet these threats that I just described, these challenges that are before us, not just climate change, not just the affordability of prescription medication, but this country fully partnering with rural America, investing in broadband internet so that everyone can get online to finish their education, to look for a job, to start a small business, to find a date tonight on Tinder so they're not so lonely. <laughs> Wanna make sure that we allow farmers to make a profit growing the food in your state, the fiber in mine, that feeds and clothes not just this country, but so much of the rest of the world. Encourage them through the next iteration of along the Mississippi River all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. I want to make sure that we meet the challenge of an epidemic of gun violence in this country. On this day, we're calling attention to gun violence. Acknowledging that there's no reason that nearly 40,000 of our fellow Americans should lose their lives this year to gun violence, a rate that we see in almost no other country on the face of
country's foreign policy overseas for the rest of us. Let's end those wars, bring them home, and find a more peaceful, successful way to pursue our goals around the world. I think if we do that, this country will be able to fulfill its potential and its promise. We're gonna be able to make sure that we satisfy not just the demands of this generation here, but the generation that follows us will be proud of the work that we committed to right here in this room in Knoxville today. Thank you for having us out today. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you for the hospitality. And Cynthia Collins got a microphone, so if you can get her attention. Um, and as she's bringing the microphone out, someone uh, shared with me that one of your governors came from Knoxville, Governor Stone, um, who was one of your two Civil War era governors. And, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, was instrumental in convincing Abraham Lincoln uh, to run for the presidency and then to secure his nomination during the convention in 1860. So learning a little bit about that history of Knoxville, I'm aware that we're in a very historical place. And but for Knoxville, this country would have taken a far different direction. So I'm um, proud to be here. Sir. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Dodd. I'm a student at Simpson College in Indianola. Um, I study international relations and political science, and I was wondering uh, what your plan would be to sort of reclaim the United States' stance on the international floor with Donald Trump, uh, taking an exit out on things like the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, yeah. TPP, and environmental trade agreements, or environmental agreements, uh, and trade agreements, and screwing most things up. Um, so what is your plan to sort of not just go back into things, go back into the foray, but also make the United States be a leader on the international stage? Yeah, great question. Um, I sometimes think about this moment from the perspective of the future. Let's say we're, we're 20, 30, 50 years down the line, and we're reading in, in our history book about the year 2019. This is a moment that the world was asking its question, uh, asking a question of itself, is the future authoritarian? or is the future democratic? It's, it's a serious open question abroad and maybe increasingly here at home as well. And in the face of that question, this is what our president has done. He has embraced the dictators, the strong men, and the authoritarians all over the world. Vladimir Putin, who we now know beyond the shadow of a doubt, invaded and involved himself in our democracy in 2016. That is the person that our president called after the release of the Mueller report and to whom he described that report as a hoax, giving him the green light to further involve himself in our democracy and the next election. But it's not just Putin, it's MBS in Saudi Arabia who is bombing Yemen into the last century. Hospitals, school buses, civilians, precipitating the greatest humanitarian crisis the world has seen since World War II and doing it with the complicity and the direct aid of the United States of America. It's Erdogan in Turkey, it's Duterte in the Philippines, and at the same time, he has turned his back on those allies, the friendship that was literally forged in that sacrifice that I described that took place 75 years ago, whether it's NATO or the European Union, or even our trading partners. He's about to impose a 5% tariff on Mexico, the destination for the corn and the soybeans and the pork that is grown and raised in this state. And at home, he defies our democratic institutions, makes fun of the judiciary, calls the press not the best defense <coughs> against tyranny, but the enemy of the people. So to your question, in the spirit of your question, if we're gonna meet the challenge of climate change, if we're gonna ensure that we have true nuclear non-proliferation around the world, if we're gonna extricate ourselves from these wars that we've been in, for some cases, decades, if we're gonna elevate the priority of Latin America so that we invest in solutions in the Northern Triangle to ensure that no family has, ever has to make a 2,000 mile journey fleeing the deadliest countries on the face of the planet, then we're gonna to have to signal to the rest of the world that the future is strongly democratic and we're gonna to return to our traditional democratic allies, and in the strength that we have through our partnerships and friendships with them, yes, we will take on China, and we will win. Yes, we will take on our foreign policy, policy challenges peacefully, and we will resolve them. 
And yes, we will make sure that the United States remains the indispensable nation. I want to make sure that in our administration, we live up to that potential and to that promise and the challenge that this president has presented for us. Thanks for asking the question. Appreciate it. In the year 2000, a few miles up the road here in Pella, Iowa, the principal financial group opened an IT office, uh, employed a lot of local people. They expanded a couple of different times, moved to larger buildings, eventually started using H-1B visa workers, decided to open an office in Penang, India, and now the office of Penang, India employs hundreds of people. The Pell office is closed. I understand you think H-1B visas are a pretty good idea. Could you fill us in on why you feel that way? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, for asking the question and for making the case that some of our policies work against the best interests of our communities, of our country, and of our workers. I want to make sure that in our administration, we produce a tax code that will punish countries for offshoring jobs that were located here in this country that this country made possible by our investment in each other's education, in the infrastructure, in that broadband internet that made that IT company's investment and success possible in the first place. But I also want to make sure that when we have job openings, millions of them in this country, that we are unable to fill with people who were born in this country, that we make it legal and possible for people to come here and work those jobs. And to your point, to make sure that that does not lead to those jobs being offshored to India or China or Mexico or some other place. There should be condition placed upon any kind of public investment or any change in our immigration laws to do that. But I know from traveling in Iowa, being in this community today, being in places like Storm Lake, immigrants are increasingly part of the population and part of the success that we see in our communities, especially smaller towns all across America are being revived by immigrants who are taking a chance on moving to them. And very often, not just working the high technology, high skill jobs, but working jobs that are in demand that ensure that we have the food that we depend on. Going back to Storm Lake, Iowa, those who are working in the meat packing plants very often are not born in Storm Lake, Iowa. They're born in Guatemala or El Salvador or Mexico, and they're coming here for the privilege to do the work that no one else was willing to do. I believe that comprehensive immigration reform that frees the millions who are living in the shadows right now, requires them to register with our government, get right with the law, pay any back taxes and fines, but then get on the road to producing even more for our economy's growth and this country's greatness, making sure that dreamers never have to fear deportation back to a country they do not know, and then ensuring that our visa caps match our actual labor and employment and family reunification needs. That not only is in our economic best interest, that is in our safety and security best interest, and this country comprised of immigrants and asylum seekers and refugees, it's in the best traditions of America as well. Thank you for asking the question, appreciate it. Hi there, Mike. Hi there, my name is Asa Lundert. Uh, uh, I just graduated from Knoxville High School, um, and I actually wanted, to, you were talking earlier about uh, a series of voter ref, uh, voter reforms in terms of voter registration, um, automatic uh, registration for uh, like 16 and 17 year olds when they turned 18, stuff like that, and that was really interesting and I support that. What I'm curious is um, where you stand on uh, what's becoming a popular subject in uh, getting rid of or reforming the Electoral College and how that relates to a popular vote system and whether you think that those sorts of systems would harm rural communities uh, like Knoxville or whether they would help the country as a whole, including helping rural communities like Knoxville. Yeah. Great question. Thank you for it. So I, I go back to, I go back to the, the very premise of the Electoral College which in some part is, is premised on the original sin of this country. That, that our wealth was built on the backs of those that we kidnapped, that our country at the time kidnapped from West Africa, brought here in bondage, and as slaves ensured that we would ultimately become the greatest, the wealthiest, the most powerful country on the face of the planet. Now, when we were writing the Constitution and deciding on apportionment in the House of Representatives, those same slaves were counted as a fraction of a person. 
so that rural, agricultural, slave-based states could have a, a greater representation in the House of Representatives. The Electoral College proportions were also based on that same premise and same fractionalization of a human being who was held in bondage. So I make the case that the very structure of the Electoral College and representation at the outset of this country was racist. And it's very hard for us to explain to our fellow Americans how the victor in the last presidential election got three million fewer votes than the loser in the last presidential election. I think a, a way to address this is to ensure that at least at a minimum that the Electoral College votes in a given state are awarded proportionately, not a winner-take-all system, which would force the nominee from the Republican and the Democratic Party to campaign in every state. You wouldn't write South Carolina off, you wouldn't write Massachusetts or California or Texas off, because you'd be trying to win some of those Electoral College votes. And to answer the last part of your question, I think that would force us to go to every part of every state, including urban centers and rural communities alike. So I think that's an improvement upon a flawed system and gets us to a, a better place as a country. Thanks for asking the question. Appreciate it. Hi, thank you for coming to, to speak with us. Of course. Um, the, the voting issues you've talked about, including now the Electoral College registration and so on, um, those are state issues at present. The state legislatures really have control over those things. Um, and the Supreme Court has gutted much of the Voting Rights Act, and they've gutted campaign financing. This is not something that the executive has a whole lot of control over. This is something that is going to require constitutional amendments. How would you, as president, try to help make those things happen? You're not directly involved. It's Congress and then it's state legislatures. Uh, in sort of a more general sense, we've given too much power to the executive. Are you willing to give some of that up? Great questions. So all of those reforms that I just mentioned uh, primarily are focused at, at the federal level. So when I talked about banning political action committee contributions, those would be to federal candidates. You're right, um, states, um, local counties, and other jurisdictions would be able to make their own decisions when it came to that. Term limits. campaign finance reform. That's why I think even that is a constitutional amendment issue. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So, so a couple of constitutional questions here. Term limits, clearly a constitutional question. Um, the Citizens United decision uh, from 2010 where the Supreme Court said that corporations are people and money is speech and therefore corporations can spend unlimited amounts of money to uh, affect elections and legislation or purchase elections and legislation. If we were to address corporate personhood, that might also have to be a, a constitutional amendment. But in order to get that done, obviously we've amended the Constitution many times in this country. You need a president who channels the frustration that so many of us have with a system that is out of touch for so many of our fellow Americans right now, that truly is rigged in the favor of those who can afford to purchase influence and outcomes. I think a president who could do that could help pass the amendments necessary at a federal level. I also mentioned investing in election security. We know the Russians have attacked us before. We know they are likely to attack us again. We know that there is some question about the legitimacy of the Secretary of State's efforts to protect against further invasions. So federal investment and coordination to make sure that we have paper receipts at the ballot box, that we audit those elections, I think that can be a, a federal issue as well. And then I'll say this, I think we can also lead by example. This campaign accepts no political action committee money, no help from lobbyists, no help from corporations or special interests. We've also taken the fossil fuel pledge so that there's not any real or perceived conflict of interest with oil and gas companies as we seek to free ourselves from the dependence on fossil fuels. And on, on your last question, the, the short answer is yes, you're absolutely right. Um, this country, through our representatives in Congress, have ceded our power to the executive. The last time, really, that we lawfully declared war was, was in World War II. Um, we've been passing these authoriz authorizations for the use of military force, and then really, as a country, at least when it comes to Congress, have been at war on autopilot. It was 18 years ago that we debated an authorization that has us in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, and those other countries 
that I mentioned today. We need to bring those wars to a close. We need to return power to people, to the representatives in Congress, to make those wars or to end those wars. So, so yes, I, I think it's important that the executive cede some of this power back to uh, the people's representatives in, in Congress. Thanks for asking the question. to have you address this issue. You voted in 2015 to lift the ban on exporting crude oil. And that's a huge problem for us in Iowa. Energy Transfer Partners is the company behind the Dakota Access Pipeline. They now want to increase the oil running through Iowa from 500,000 barrels per day to nearly a million. That increases the risk of a spill and amounts to carbon emissions equivalent to 60 coal-fired power plants. How do you justify your vote? Much of this country and much of the world still depends on oil and gas. I, I made a commitment that by 2050, we will be uh, net zero greenhouse gas emissions in the US. We'll be halfway there by 2030. But until we get there, I drove here today in a Dodge Grand Caravan that burns gasoline. That's happening over much of the rest of the world as well. I want to make sure that this country can secure its energy independence. And given the fact that we are at war all over the Middle East, and this president has threatened war in Venezuela, which happens to have the largest proven reserves of oil right now, I want to free ourselves from having to go to war to secure our energy needs. So I'm really proud of those jobs in Texas and other parts of the country that allow us to live the life that we lead now. And I'm also confident that though we need to improve our standards, they're among the highest in the world. So that energy is going to have to be extracted somewhere. I want to make sure that we, we, we do it here. Um, to the question of pipelines, I want you to make the decision on that. I don't, I don't support the Dakota Access Pipeline. I think local communities should be able to make the decision about whether there's energy exploration in their communities or energy passing under their communities. So I'm, I'm with you on that point. But, but the larger picture for me is that we've got 10 years left to us to make really big, bold, dramatic changes in how we use energy. My home state of Texas also happens to be the leader in the generation of wind energy right now. We need to do far more in that direction. Also invest in the technology for storage of renewable energy so we can distribute it at will on a grid. And then all these cars and vans, including the one that I came in today, as soon as possible must be running on electricity or hydrogen or some renewable energy source so that we're no longer burning uh, oil and gasoline. So you've got my commitment on that, and that's my explanation for the vote that I took in the past. Thank you for asking the question. Appreciate it. Yes, Ms. Cummings. I'm, I'm Bella, and I wanted to know what are you going to do about college affordability for young I'm going to make sure that it's affordable. Um, we have $1.5 trillion in outstanding student loan debt right now. That's more than all the credit card debt in this country combined. And on average now, the graduating college senior has about $40,000 on her back that she will be forced to pay off at some point over the course of her life because that's the one kind of debt that you cannot shake until you've paid it off or until you are in the grave. So here's my proposal. One, let's stop digging the hole. Let's make community college free to every single American, free when you're 18 years old, free when you're 45 years old, and your job has been automated out of existence, and you need to retrain or reskill or learn a new profession so that you can have a career that will allow you to command a living wage. Let's elevate unions instead of diminishing them in states like mine in Texas and yours in Iowa so that more people can join an apprenticeship and also learn a trade or a skill for life and for lifetime guaranteed to come back and reskill and retrain without taking on a dime of debt. Public serving, publicly financed four-year institutions. Let's make sure that they're debt-free, not just for tuition, but for room and board and books. And then let's vastly increase our investment in historically black colleges 
and universities, they very often have a much smaller endowment, and so tuition is much higher at them. I think that's a public value, and there should be a public investment made in them. Lastly, if you're one of those who is carrying some of that uh, student loan debt burden right now, I want to provide some relief. Let's, at a minimum, refinance your debt at much lower interest rates. And then maximally, let's expand vastly the public service debt forgiveness program. If you're willing to teach school or work in one of those 45,000 unfilled positions in the VA, serve someone who put his life on the line or her life on the line for this country, I want to wipe clean the outstanding student loan debt that you right now, that you have right now, so that you can focus on that student or that veteran or that public service that you want to provide. So I think that's how we meet this challenge and make sure that cost is not an object to anyone wanting to improve themselves through higher education or joining a union. Thank you for the question. Appreciate it. Okay. Hi, welcome to Iowa. Thank you. <laughs> I I read a part of an article in with Mr. Kristoff that said food won't grow here anymore, and it broke my heart. I don't know if you're familiar with that article. He went down to Guatemala oh. and he just talked to the people and asked them why they were making that trek north, and it's a heartbreaking article. And I want to know what you would do to help those people because it sounded like a lot of the problem that they're facing, they're not getting any grain at all. They can't grow any food. Their children are starving. So do you have a plan to help those countries and keep those children from starving to death? Yes. Good. This is something we're seeing <laughs> all, all over the world. And and anyone who thinks that, that climate change is a distinct, separate issue is, is dead wrong. It's involved in, in every single part of our life. Our, our food, uh, our livelihoods, the, the public health, our economy, um, the way that communities, especially lower income and communities of color, are impacted in this country. Amy and I were in West Texas during the Senate race, very small town, at a town hall like this one, only about 10 people, though, were, were there uh, on that Sunday morning. And I remember uh, a young woman came in, a farmer, and she brought her kids, and she said, I'm missing my son's basketball game to be at your town hall. Never been at one of these before. Never thought I'd make my first with a Democrat. But I'm here to tell you that what my grandparents planted and grew, what my parents planted and grew, I am planting, and it is not growing anymore. Climate change, she told Amy and me, is not something we have to be prepared for. It is happening right now. She was telling us there was going to be no farm for those kids that she brought in with her. We're seeing that in the United States as well. Where things are growing right now is constantly moving north. And so you mentioned Guatemala. In addition to those kids and families who are fleeing the most violent countries on the face of the planet, we are also increasingly seeing farmers from the Northern Triangle who are facing one of the greatest droughts they've ever experienced. If you think that the 400,000 apprehensions that we had on the U.S.-Mexico border last year was a crisis. Wait until some countries in the Western Hemisphere can no longer support human life because that's exactly where we are headed. So meeting this two degrees Celsius challenge by putting everything that we've got into taking ourselves off of fossil fuels and embracing renewable energy, putting farmers in the driver's seat is absolutely critical. And then I do the following. I'd also invest in solutions to violence in the Northern Triangle, and I'd also invest United States know-how in farming technology and send some of these farmers down to Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador as well to do everything that we can to ensure that we're using best practices in those countries so that they can feed themselves. If we do that, people are gonna be able to stay at home and not have to make that 2,000 mile journey. So that's the way that we can meet it in the long term and in the short term and do the right thing. Thanks for asking the question. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Oli and I'm
LGBT person. <laughs> Ollie, thank you for being here for the, for the question. You're right, um, disproportionately amongst homeless youth, um, we see members of our LGBTQ community who, for whatever reason, could not stay at home, were not welcomed at home, um, didn't feel right being at home, and, and are now on the streets. And, and sometimes with, with some really tragic outcomes, um, whether it is uh, being forced to self-medicate because they don't have access to healthcare or prescription drug medication, or in some cases, having to uh, participate in the sex trade because it's the only way they, they can get by. Um, we got to visit the Ali Forney Center in, in Harlem in New York, which is a youth homeless shelter um, specifically for members of the LGBTQ community where we learned some of these stories firsthand. And it was really powerful. And so I wanna make sure that we're both investing in solutions, taking care of those who find themselves homeless and being able to transition them into permanent housing and care, but I also want to make sure that we stop creating the problem in the first place. In many of our states, it's perfectly legal to fire somebody based on their sexual orientation. In my home state of Texas, we have 30,000 kids in the foster care system, badly funded so that kids were sleeping on the desks at the CPS offices, and by law in Texas, you can be too gay to adopt one of those kids who needs a safe and loving home that someone in Texas could provide, except for the law. So as president, I want to sign into law the Equality Act, which will protect the full civil rights of every single American and ensure that no one can be discriminated against based on sexual orientation. On day one, I will reverse the president's transgender troop ban to make sure that we welcome the service of every American. And I'll also make sure that this rhetoric that we're hearing and seeing in this administration of hatred and intolerance and racism that doesn't just offend our sensibilities, but has led to a rise in hate crimes every single one of the last three years, is replaced by an administration who doesn't just tolerate or respect our differences, but embraces those differences because we understand that's what makes us stronger and safer and more successful and secure. So you've got my commitment on that and would love for you to be part of the leadership to make that happen. Thank you for asking the question. Thank you for having us out here today. We are very grateful and thank you for introducing us. Um, we really appreciate it. And Cynthia, we're, we're, we're gonna hang out for a little bit for anyone who